I, I think the tempo you took Sweet Georgia Brown was, was just about Oscar's tempo. <laughs> I'm still out of breath. <laughs> yeah. uh, Oscar was, uh, nobody could play as fast as that guy and, and burn up the place like the walls want to fall down, you know, and it was, it was like thunder, you know, and it's so amazing to witness such elegance at the same time with such power, such mastery of the instrument and um, be swinging like the cows come home, man. Well, let, let's talk about swing for a second, because clearly you guys are swinging. Everybody's swinging. Everyone's, I'm seeing all the heads bopping and then the feet tapping. Your foot is tapping. What, what is it about, about swing? How, how, do, how do you find swing? How do you, do you, can you teach swing? I think perhaps by exposure to it in a very deep, loving, personal way, somebody can pick up on what that's all about. But it's very, very uh, specific to a certain lifestyle, a certain approach to a lot, of, a lot of things. But to me, it's such a special and precious part of what this is that it's like life itself. It's the heartbeat. And if, if the heart is beaten in that way where there's life to it, there's a pulse. And that pulse is what I hear when I hear rhythm. And if you, you can approach it very tenderly, very affectionately, and yet you can get bombastic with the whole thing, but, but, but swing, it's a funny word that came up. I don't know who coined it. It was probably a disc jockey, you know? I mean, I don't know, but it's like, just imagine, you know? It just doesn't stop. It's like a pendulum. And you get on board that pendulum thing and you can't get off sometimes because it feels so good. So I am um, call it a merchant of, of swinging because that's what makes me love this. Is, but, you know, it's not just the rhythm. It's about the melody. It's about the harmony, it's about all of that coming together. And when you have a team of people who feel the same way, you go to the moon. Well, you've got, uh, yes, you've got a trio. That, that's a swinging drummer you have there. And uh, I, I've, I've first presented with Art Harper about 20 years ago on, on a Rising Stars of Jazz series, and now he's an old man. He has risen. He has risen. <laughs> But, but let, me, let me ask you about, uh, d does your swing, uh, is it different because of where your background is from and where you come from? Is, it, is, is there a little more calypso in your it's swing? A good point I want to tell you about. We don't analyze these things, we don't think about them, but how you play, how you feel, it's like your fingerprint. It's just totally, totally different. And in earlier times, some of us musicians, we could hear an artist playing on a recording and immediately know how it was after just three bars because you could, it was so personal. It was easier to be more personal before computers, truthfully, because that kind of took time away. You know, it, we, need, we had more time to marinate. I call it marinate the stuff. <laughs> but as far as the Calypso phrase that you use, indeed, there were several musicians who played their instruments, and I share a really great privilege with the great Oscar Peterson. His family was from Barbados, and the Virgin Islands. Yeah, St. Kitts. St. Kitts. Yeah. St. Kitts, I've heard Barbados. But the point is that there's just, it's just in the water. <laughs> and in the rice and beans, too. And the rice and peas and the saltfish anaki and all those things. <laughs> but I heard uh, from a very early age, I heard the Calypso musicians, and among others that they say because of their coming from the islands, you gotta dance. There's no way not to dance, folks. You gotta give up, get up and move those feet, you know? And one of those musicians that was very much like that was Wynton Kelly. And Wynton Kelly started playing and he just bounced, you know, and that's what Oscar did. And that's what I actually love so much. And, uh, you know, Sonny Rollins is from the islands. There's a great heritage of players of African descent that came through the islands and it's a different variation on the whole thing. And you can oftentimes tell it. And where does clave fit into into that? More Afro-Cuban than than maybe uh, Caribbean well, and Jamaican. The word clave, and um, and I'm I'm not one to analyze things as much as the teachers and so on. But there is um, that that all the islands and in South America and in especially in West Africa, there is a different way to feel that. And when you hear that beat, I think that was the first sound 
prehistoric people used when they were sending messages to another place. <laughs> because it was like, that sound was just a connection with, with everything, and it's a, it's a very unique uh, rhythm, very African, of course, but you hear that in Indian music, you hear it in um, Arabic music, and um, it just locks everything together, but you hear it differently in Brazil, you hear it differently in Cuba, and it's kind of like pepper. You have a certain sauce in Jamaica, it tastes that way. You go to Cuba, it's a little different. You go to Puerto Rico, it's different. So it's, it's uh, unique. Danilo Perez once said, some people say, how are you, I'm fine. And other people say, I'm fine, how are you? It's the same, same clave rhythm, but it's a very different accent. Yeah, well, it's the uh, same thing, but different. <laughs> so when, when did you first encounter Oscar personally? Well, I met Oscar in the early 60s. I went, uh, I saw him playing at Basin Street East in New York, and that was one of the great jazz clubs. I had come, I had a wonderful moment of serendipity. I had come from Jamaica when I was 17 years old, and I was playing in Miami, Florida. Kind of underage and illegal, if you know what I mean. I, I, had my, I had my visa, mind you, but I was playing in a bar where it was kind of shady characters. And while I was playing there, you talk about good luck, in walked Frank Sinatra. And I got a job playing at a club in New York that he used to attend when he, was, when he wanted to stay up late and drink. He'd be drinking late at night. And so I was there. And I remember going to Basin Street East while I was there. This was about 1964. But Ray Brown was so, such an impression on me because he actually resembled an uncle of mine on the record. I said, that looked like Uncle Jim. And those notes he played on the bass was like, shake this building. He just... It's just an amazing sound he heard. Well, I got to meet Ray years later, and we just had a great coming together, and he invited me to play with him. And through knowing Ray, I got to know Oscar much better. And he was really great to me. Of course, he liked to tease you a lot. <laughs> he just always playing practical jokes on you. And um, he, he just was a very uh, kind person with most musicians, and in my case, he even recommended me to a record company he was with called MPS in Germany. And I made about 10 albums with that company. This was from the early 70s. But I just felt a great kinship with that man and was one of my better things to happen to me. Do you think it was because he was a little bit uh, a fish out of water being Canadian in, in a very African-American, Afri African-American centric jazz scene and you were a fish out of water coming from Jamaica? I, th I think maybe so, but you know, I would see him and he would say something very West Indian and say, what's up, little boy, what are you doing, or something like that. And, I, and I would talk back to him and we'd giggle a lot and laugh about it, you know. And uh, of course, we all have this reference to the Queen. <laughs> She's not here tonight. She's not here tonight. <laughs> so when you have that, the British influence and something about the way you behave, you know, because Oscar personified dignity and a certain way of being all the time. You know, he, if he dropped his guard, it was in the dressing room, you know, but he, he maintained a decorum that was very, very inspiring to me, because to me, this is a great dignity. We're not just playing, you know, in a bar or something. This is, to us, the highest point of jazz is Beethoven and Bach and Brahms and that's Duke Ellington was our, our Beethoven and Bach. So this is a, a great legacy. And Oscar made that so impressive. And there were others that I saw. Errol Garner was a big impression on me. Er Ahmad Jamal was a great impression on me. There was such a dignity in the way these men approached their work. The modern Jazz Quartet, those men, I got to know them well. well. Milt Jackson, you did so many records with. Milt Jackson and Ray Brown, they allowed me into their chamber. And I uh, had a ball with those cats. We were swinging hard, I'm telling you. Well, yesterday, we, uh, the, the trio came in a day early, and you did a, a student matinee for about 600 uh, Toronto school district kids. What a kick. Uh, mostly fifth and sixth graders. Yeah. And I, I, it was an amazing morning. And I, I, uh, I was getting a coffee afterwards, and two girls fifth graders came out of the bathroom and I, I said, how would you like the show? And they said, oh man, it was so cool, it was great. I said, have you ever seen a jazz concert before? And she said, no, um, 
But it kind of reminded me, I was at the symphony once, and that was really cool, too. Yeah. Well, I, so, got, I just want to say, as much as a lot of fun it is playing for you folks, older folks, <laughs> I got to tell you, it's such a thrill to sit at the piano and do what we do, enjoy what we're doing, and to see several hundred kids clapping their hands and smiling and really being attentive because they were good. You know, they weren't like throwing stuff around. <laughs> and um, I, I walked out here feeling, man, this, this is all right. Because the whole attitude, I think, that he, Oscar Peterson and other greats had, that first time you walk up to the instrument, that sense of thrill, that glee, that, that joy that you have when you go to the instrument, is what you want to maintain your whole life through. You'll be 90 years old when you get up to sing or play, you're a child again. Because there's a purity in that whole thing, if, if, if it's really going to be what it can be. And Oscar, with his serious demeanor, man, that guy was having a ball. He was just swinging like no business. And, and I, that's the way I feel. And um, the children kind of help to make you have hope for the future because the stuff going on out there is not always so pure and uplifting. But this, this, is, this will help. This music is good. I want to ask you about one other thing. Probably many people in the audience don't know that you worked with Clint Eastwood on uh, a movie called Bird about Charlie Parker. Uh, just, just tell me yeah. briefly uh, uh, how, uh, how, what was that how like? That and and he, he's, a, he's a great musician himself as well as an actor and a director. Well, he, he's, you know, I'm a big West. Look at them boots. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Westerns, you know. In fact, Clint Eastwood said the two, fi uh, the two gifts America gave the world was jazz and the Western movie. <laughs> and um, I was very excited to be a part of anything Clint Eastwood did. But Ray Brown had come to me and said, I want you to come and um, play on this uh, recording. It's a strange thing, but it's going to be great. So he had his, the drummer was Johnny Garin, who's no longer with us, and Ray, who passed away just about 10 years now, almost 10 years. But um, I went to the Warner Brothers, and uh, indeed, they were making this movie, because he's such a jazz fan that he decided he wanted to tell a story from his vantage point of Charlie Parker. And um, Charlie Parker was this most amazing saxophone player, but he had this uh, challenged life, you know? He was having a hard time in one way or another. So it's, in Hollywood, they, they want to tell stories of, that are you know, sometimes tragic in one way or another. But um, we had headphones on, and we started playing with some old tapes that Clint Eastwood got from Charlie Parker's widow. And we played with Charlie Parker, but he wasn't there. It was just, uh, and then when I was playing, just a few feet away was Mr. Eastwood sitting there swinging along with us. And it was a kick, because he's just a regular guy. If I have to put it that way. He's, that's why some of these people who become so famous and important, some of them, are just regular folks, and he's one of them. So I just got to tell you, it was a big kick. Well, we, we uh, sitting in the audience in the first half, we know you're a regular folk too. You're an old school piano player. You're a talented uh, pedagogue, uh, and you don't ever have stop having fun. And that is, it's so infectious to the audience, and we thank you. Uh, to, I just want to say one thing. This man is 66 years old, and... Uh, <laughs> I never no, believed it. No, I ain't no 66, it. man. Yeah. I'm 39. But I didn't. I had no idea what, until I looked you up your bio this afternoon. Because you're so full of life, uh, and, and it's just a pleasure to have well, you. Well, the way I look at it, if you try not to fall down in those paths of darkness, and you take your business and try to think the good thoughts, and you do this, you can be around for a while. <laughs> We're going to get back to the music. Thank you, Monty.